Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are. And welcome to this Tech Strong Learning Experience brought to you by Sunrise Security. My name is Cody, and I'm the host of Tech Strong Learning, and we have an exciting presentation ahead. Before we get things kicked off, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, perhaps you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude this live session today. If you'd like to engage with us, there are a couple of ways you can do so. The first option is the chat tab. You'll find that on the right side of your screen. And we'd like you to go ahead and start warming that up for us right now by letting us know from where you're joining us. If you have any questions, we do want you to direct those to the Q&A tab just so we can help keep track of them better. If you do happen to send that into the chat um, and it disappears, don't be alarmed, I'm just moving that over to our Q&A section. If you jump over to where it says handouts, you'll see there are a couple of additional resources that are available, so feel free to grab those. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around for the duration of our topic today. So today we will be discussing lessons from a live hack, secure your cloud from the inside. And I'm joined today by Jeff Moncrief, Field CTO at Sunrise Security. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today on Tech Strong Learning. Would you like to go ahead and get this live hack going? I would love to. Cody, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I certainly appreciate everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it should be a fun, interactive um, session where uh, I'm not going to be spending too much time, hopefully in slides. We're going to be spending the majority of the time um, actually showing folks, uh, showing everyone here in the audience exactly what it looks like to um, exploit the identity fabric, the IAM fabric in the public cloud, uh, which is really the, the world with which uh, I've lived for the last three years uh, ever since joining Sunry Security. So, uh, I, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount since coming over here, and I hope that uh, the folks that are watching today that they can take away a few nuggets um, based on what we're going to go through. So with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, we're going to talk initially just for, for an agenda for everyone here. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of the problem that, uh, that I see day in and day out as uh, um, a sales leader and the field CTO here at Sunry uh, as it relates to um, threats in the public cloud extending way beyond just traditional what we would call cloud security posture management scenarios. And... Um, we're then going to actually walk everyone through, which is, I know that's why everyone's here. Uh, we're going to walk through what an actual exploit looks like, a real live hack uh, in a real Amazon environment. And uh, we're going to walk you through how someone would do reconnaissance, maneuver, privileged escalation, and ultimately data theft uh, through the IAM fabric where there is no network. And uh, it's just really, we're going to, it's exciting for me because this, this proves that it's real. A lot of what we talk about here with the messaging and the value proposition at Sunry, um, it is real. And that's what we're going to walk you through as well as show you what it looks like inside Sunry, uh, the product itself, how Sunry predicted it, how Sunry was tracking the movement that, that I was doing and some really, really neat things there. And then we're going to kind of conclude with uh, the takeaways about how you should really approach securing this in the public cloud. Uh, it's an inside out approach. We'll get into what I mean by that as we dig into uh, the material here in the presentation, but uh, really just some best practices as it relates to access and privilege in the public cloud uh, and removing a bunch of unnecessary risk. But how do you do that? We're going to walk you through that. And then um, we'll be taking some questions here at the end. I'll be asking Cody uh, for any questions. So please do submit those there in the online question form. So with that being said, um, Let's jump into it. So, you know, this first particular uh, column that you see here on this slide, it says identity crisis. Make no mistake about it. That is what we uh, see in almost every prospect or customer that we talk to here at Sunry. Um, for years and years and years, uh, development teams, DevOps teams uh, through CI, CD pipelines, they've been pushing infrastructure as code constantly out, uh, sometimes as often as every two weeks or, or every day, uh, with far too many permissions and entitlements uh, on identities. They leave them behind. They leave them orphaned. There's really no accountability. And uh, when you have that that's been happening for years and years and years, uh, through turnover, through attrition, through different priority changes, 
you have a lot of artifacts out there living and breathing in the public cloud that you do not have visibility into, but they present risk as it relates to the identity fabric itself across the public cloud. And, you know, what we find, it's like shooting fish in a barrel for us. Yes, you're going to find orphaned identities, most of them non-person identities, machine accounts, service accounts, service principles, access keys and tokens, those kinds of things. But you're also going to find um, far too many permissions on these person and non-person identities. And then you're going to find things like privileged escalation scenarios, separation of duties violations. And it's because if, if I take this back to old school um, you know, principles, it's because everything's been deployed out there in the public cloud and everything can talk to everything for the most part. It's like deploying a giant data center and forgetting to put in firewalls. Or if you do, the firewalls are few and far between and they have not been managed or maintained. That's kind of what Sun receives when we plug into our customer environments. And it just creates this spider web of conduits with which an adversary can maneuver. Direct access, indirect access, they can jump from one identity into another, into another, that would then give them access to something that they should have never had access to. And then you have the fact that the adversaries understand this. They understand that nine times out of 10, and this is, there's so many statistics that back this up, nine times out of 10, they can just log in. So everyone's worried about vulnerabilities and we need to protect the workloads. When the adversary can just log in, not necessarily just by exploiting a workload, but they can just log in from the command line using a stolen access key to get out of GitHub. So the adversary, the bad actors, they understand that there's all kinds of different ways that they can get in and start to exploit this. And what we tell customers is that it's not if, it's when. So at some point in time, someone is going to get a credential through social engineering, through uh, public disclosure, whatever it might be, and they're going to log in. You have to be thinking about what next and minimizing that impact or that blast radius. Okay. And ultimately, what are they going to get in and do? They're going to try and access data. They're going to try and encrypt data. They're going to try and steal data. They might just try and take down a critical application that sits in a very, very sensitive production environment. So it really is about what's sensitive and what matters most to the business or whichever prospect that we're talking to. But when we do talk to these customers, we will ask them a question. We'll say, hey, listen, this is where your critical application is. Maybe this is where your sensitive data lake is. Can you tell me every identity that can access it right now across every different account through every possible conduit? They don't have a capability that can do that. And that's where things get scary. So just some really, really interesting things that Sunry can come in and kind of expose from what's already out there from a threat landscape perspective that's, um, that's ready to be taken advantage of. And this leads me to us getting into the actual live hack that we're about to do. All right. And when I was thinking about how to do this live hack, I was like, you know, I can do because the, we're going to exploit a workload that does have log4j, the vulnerable version on it. OK, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to build uh, an exploit and actually get root using uh, a web command through LDAP to actually get access to root on this EC2 instance that we're going to talk about here. In doing so, I came across this particular um, article and this was. All of these different articles are dated around March 24th of this year. So about three weeks ago. And if you were not aware of it, it was a huge exposure. Every major publication uh, picked it up. But GitHub's private RSA SSH key was accidentally published in a public GitHub repository. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. You can read about it. You can read about how it happened, how long it was out there. But that gave me the idea that, you know, it really is as simple as they just log in. We say this all the time. They just log in. They don't hack. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of play this scenario out and show you what this looks like. If someone were to get someone's private key out of a GitHub repo that was accidentally posted and made public and then, then take advantage of it to access and do things uh, nefariously in the public cloud. Okay. So, Let's get into it. Let's get into the fun stuff here. Okay. So the very first thing that I want everyone to understand is that um, we are going to be taking advantage of a live AWS environment and uh, we're going to be maneuvering through the identity fabric and we're going to be using an EC2 instance as the conduit to exploit and then get access into that environment. It is a real instance. It is living and breathing uh, and it is currently being monitored 
by Sunry. All right. And uh, here's a glimpse of the Sunry Identity Insights and Cloud Insights dashboard. We're going to be taking a look at this in a minute. But as far as the story goes, this is my personal GitHub repo. Yes, this is Hacker Man from Kung Fury. If anyone is familiar with that cult kind of classic, um, love it. Anyways, um, we're going to take a look at this and assume the scenario of I'm just doing some recon, digging through some, some public GitHub repos as a bad actor, just seeing that there's something out there that I can maybe take advantage of. OK, and I, I come across this public repo. I see there's a couple of different uh, repositories in it and I see something called Sunry. Well, I go into Sunry and I see that there's two different files. The very first one, as an intelligent adversary, I know exactly what a .pim file is, okay? That might be an SSH private key file, okay? So if I click it, there you go. This is a real private key. No, it does not lead anywhere, so it's not worth anyone copying, okay? It's not useful, but it is real. I did generate it in a key pair, okay? So I now know this is someone's private key, okay? Uh, to access something, but I don't know what. All right. Well, there's also another file in this repo called miscellaneous app info. And if I open this up, it says miscellaneous app information processor workload. Well, that's interesting. It's a workload. It's processing something. And it says operating system, Linux, AWS, AMI. It has an IP address. Now, I did not put the real IP address I'm going to be using here. Okay. It's a 192.168 or private one. But you see this right here, function, retrieve dev web input and write to S3 in a prod via Lambda. Okay, so this is super interesting. And there's a chance that this file is related to that SSH key that's also in this repository, right? Obviously as an adversary, I know that this should not be here. Someone did this by mistake, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna see if we can use that private key file to access that IP address, okay? And I'm actually already logged in. So I'll show you what this looks like, okay? Um, so this is my command line. Hopefully everyone can see it uh, on my laptop. All you have to do is grab that PIM file, okay? And SSH to that IP address that you grabbed out of that miscellaneous info file and see what happens, all right? Now I've already done it obviously, but normally it would ask you to accept uh, the key. You'd say yes, all of a sudden you're in. It's that simple. So I'm now in this um, Linux EC2 instance, okay? Well, super interesting because, you know, if you think about it, it is a Linux AMI. All right, so it's got, you know, PWD, um, Uname minus A or top. It's a fully functioning Linux operating system. So it's a workload, right? It's, and this is how most people think about virtual machines and workloads in AWS is that they are functioning as infrastructure. Here's where things get interesting, okay? What they don't realize is that when you deploy that EC2 instance, okay, it actually has an invisible, I call it an umbilical cord that connects it to the AWS platform itself. And folks aren't thinking about that. And so at the same time that it's a fully functioning operating system, Linux, I can type in AWS help and it is going to walk me through every single command that I can try and run from the AWS command line while on this particular workload, DynamoDB, Route 53, S3, et cetera, right? So that's all well and good, but by default, the workload doesn't have any permissions to go do anything, right? Um, but that also hinders the business that have probably deployed this workload because this workload should be doing a function, okay? And so what we've got here is um, a scenario where if I actually just type in, I'm going to bring up my command list over here. If I just type in the caller identity command, I can ask the system, who am I? Well, look at this. You're not just an EC2 instance now. I am something called Tableau Tester. Tableau Tester, I don't know what that is, but it must, it's another identity, okay? So I actually have not just headless permissions, I have the permissions of something called 
Tableau Tester. And if I pivot back to the AWS CLI here, or, or command line, I'm, I'm sorry, portal here, you'll see that there is indeed an IAM role that's been attached to this. This is almost always the case when deploying workloads in the cloud. Why? Because this piece of compute needs permissions to go do something. So it's been assigned the role of Tableau Tester. And of course, my, uh, of course I get logged out. Um, but the point is that, and I'll log back in over here in a second if I can, but the point is that uh, you are now another identity, okay? And at this point in time, you can do things like, I can try and list buckets, okay? Because I know that there's permissions that are probably gonna be attached to this. Well, if I try and list S3 contents, um, there's uh, an S3 repository just called My Health Sandbox, which must mean that I'm in a sandbox environment right now, sandbox account. And if I actually try and enumerate the contents there, there's nothing there, okay? There are no buckets, there's nothing there. It's an empty environment. Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. And so at this point in time, maybe I will try and enumerate other roles that might give me something that I could go do. And if I scroll up, you'll see I issued the command right here, AWS IAM list roles, okay? And these are the different roles that this particular role that I am automatically dropped in as Tableau Tester can then go access, okay? Very, very interesting. Now I could go and try every single one of those, but maybe I don't know where I wanna start from a bad actor standpoint, okay? That's where maybe I can start poking around. And if I just list the contents of the home directory of this user that I just logged in as, you'll see that there's a couple of interesting files, okay? And that's because we actually use this instance to do a lot of different tests for customers. But there's a lambda bucket policy.json file. Super interesting, especially when you, we remember that back in the, in the GitHub repo file, it mentioned something about a Lambda writing something to prod. Well, I'm in a sandbox right now, but that right there might get me somewhere else closer to the promised land. All right, so if I cat that file, look at this. It actually says that there's a role called medical results reader in another account that this EC2 instance has some ability to go get data out of, okay? So why don't we see what we can do with that particular role, all right? And so what we wanna do is we wanna try and jump. We wanna try and assume it and see what, what that will get us. There we go. We didn't jump yet, but we created a token, a session token that's gonna allow us to start to change our identity, okay? This is where the privileged escalation this is where the lateral movement comes into play through the actual service provider platform itself. Okay, so we're gonna issue three commands. These are a little bit, uh, uh, just give me a few minutes here because these are actually real. We're doing this in real time, okay? The first thing that we need to do is we need to set the uh, secret access key. The next thing that we need to do is we need to set the uh, session token. Paste that command over. The token is this large value right here. Paste it, hit enter. And then the last thing that we need to do is we need to enter the access key ID, that last value up here, all right? So we're gonna paste that in, hit enter, okay? Now, what do we do? We're gonna ask the platform who am I? Look at that. You are no longer the Tableau tester role in the original account. You are now in another account and your name is medical results reader. Jeff is MMR, just what I named it in the initial command when I generated the token. Okay. Well, okay. Interesting. So now I know that I've been able to move into another environment laterally, I don't know that it's sandbox or prod. All I know is that I've been able to jump from one area to another, but I wonder what's out there. I issue the same command as I issued before where there was nothing in S3. Now you've got something called custom bot code, 
um, genetic testing data uploads or something called x-ray image data. Well, that's interesting. So why don't we enumerate what's in my health app prod? That's a bucket. That must mean that I've gone from sandbox to prod. Well, look at this. There's a lot of different artifacts that are enumerating, but what's most interesting is where this is going to stop in those last three files. There's a credit card file. There's a credit card, well, Word file, Excel file, and another Word file. Super interesting, okay? Now, as the adversary, all I have to do to copy that and download it is this copy S3 command. I've now brought it down onto my local machine or the actual workload itself. At this point, I can exfiltrate it. I mean, if I wanted to, I could um, cat it. It is an Excel file. It's not gonna really do anything exciting there. Right, but it is. It could be a CSV. It could be a text file. It could be JSON. the The possibilities are, are really endless as far as what someone could grab. Okay, so that's kind of the end to end scenario, right? And what I want to do is now show you what this looks like inside um, Sunry. But I also want to show you these are the commands that I used. Okay, and these I did this all by hand manually, all right? An adversary is gonna be doing this programmatically at scale, exponentially at scale versus what I just did. So they're gonna be enumerating roles automatically, programmatically, can I get somewhere? No, can I get somewhere? No, can I get somewhere? No, right? I just did this step by step so that everyone would understand it, uh, understand the process, but most more often than not, this is all gonna be done programmatically, okay? Now, if we log into Stealth, uh, if we log into uh, Sunry, and what you'll see here is that we our homepage is called Cloud Insights, all right? And this is where Sunry is able to plug into um, our customers' different public cloud environments across AWS, Azure, GCP, and Oracle. And we discover everything that's out there. We map everything relationally using our patented technology. And that allows us to understand their cloud and give them visibility in a way that they never had before. Uh, with, a, with a significant em em emphasis on the identity fabric itself, the IM fabric. And what you'll see here, you know, we can focus on data or identities or workloads, some really neat capabilities, but Sunry has the ability to really bubble up what could do the most damage to the organization at any point in time, all right? And you'll see that one of the top things that we have found is that you need to remediate a cloud workload Vulnerability, it has vulnerabilities and it has a, a high Sunry Risk Index score. And it's called My Health Sandbox Automate. Well, that was the exact EC2 instance that we were taking a look at just a few minutes ago. All right. So if we go into the ticket itself here, what you're going to see is that Sunry did indeed figure out that it's got Log4j. Okay. It is uh, living, breathing. It does. I put that on there. It legit has Log4j. Sunry has also figured out using our graph that it has a network exposure. Okay, well, I think that we've proven that out because we just popped it um, by logging straight into it uh, as root with the private SSH key over the internet. Okay, this is where, if you think about that, one of those first lines that I showed you, this is where the CSPM uh, story is not enough because this is where most native tools, and as well as a lot of uh, third-party CSPM tools, they kind of stop. Right. They're able to tell you, hey, you know, you have some misconfigurations that have exposures. But what they can't tell you is what's on the other side of this workload. If you kind of think about this white blank area to the left, what next? OK. And if I just flip the view here to the identity view, you're going to see that Sunry is able to explain to you every possible scenario or conduit that this particular piece of compute can lead to internally. And you'll see the very first role is this Tableau tester, which is exactly what we dropped in and immediately assumed by default, because as you saw, it's attached to the instance right there in uh, the web console. And then you'll see that we figured out that because of this policy and trust relationship right here, it allows you to assume this role, assume this role, and then this role. Well, the, what is this role called? Medical results reader. This is the one that we took advantage of, okay? And if we then turn around and pivot to the node view itself, you're gonna see that 
for this piece of compute, it actually has permissions into an org account, a stage account, the sandbox that it's in, as well as prod. You can also see the used and unused permissions. More importantly, you can see in prod, it doesn't just have access to S3. I could have made my way into DynamoDB, KMS, or the Secrets Manager. In S3, we're showing you right here that credit card file that we stole, that Excel file. Here's the exact identity chain that allowed it to happen. The important thing is that Sunry is able to figure this out on day one for our customers. End-to-end -end attack path scenarios, and we can tell our customers, is there a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Is there lateral movement? Is there privileged escalation? Is there cross-account risk that it leads to a scenario like I just demonstrated to you here? The other really interesting thing is that if I kind of go back over here to this view and pop back open one of those identity amplifiers. If I move to Tableau Tester, and we actually take a look at the node view for that, Sunry doesn't just do a great job of mapping out identity chains and all of the risk there that you would have otherwise not known about, but it actually can do tracking, okay? So if you see here, it's actually tracking through the CloudTrail logs every bit of activity on that particular role. So if I move to the medical results reader role, well, you're going to see the fact that I'm assuming it from Tableau Tester. This is my IP address right here at my house, okay? And you can see exactly which roles were being assumed from here. The, the, the neat thing is, is that it provides us the ability, two really incredible abilities with our anomaly detection, to alert if something is ever used that should never have been used, and then alert if there's ever new identity chains or paths to data, or maybe a cross account trust that's creating a very risky scenario to the business that you would have not otherwise known about, well, most likely from an infrastructure as code push, something like that. And uh, so just some really, really neat capabilities there to map out kind of the risk landscape that I painted there uh, in the live kind of demonstration, but also the ability to monitor and set tripwires to alert if these conditions are suddenly created tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, et cetera. So let's get back to um, the next kind of phase uh, of this presentation, okay? So now that you kind of understand this world of risk, it's real, uh, and there's some technologies and capabilities out there to actually make sense of it, expose it, and help you fix it, um, let's talk about how you do that, okay? So go back into presenter mode here. Um, when I talk to customers about the public cloud, I use a couple of different analogies. Um, and it helps folks really understand this world that we're talking about, the world that I just demonstrated to you. And one of those is a hub and a spoke. Uh, a lot of the, the organizations that we work with, they, are, they have very, very great uh, vulnerability management programs on their workloads. Maybe they have agents, maybe they have scanners, whether agent-based scanners or agentless. Um, but they're very, very focused on those workloads themselves. And make no mistake about it, that's something that you have to be thinking about. It's something that you have to secure. But when you secure the public cloud, you have got to do a layered in defense strategy. And when I ask customers, what if, what's going to happen when someone gets on one of those workloads, when they exploit Log4j, when they do something like I just did with a PIM file that was accidentally exposed in a GitHub repo, can you tell me what that particular workload leads to? That's where things start to get vague. And that's where the concern and the worry comes into play. And you need to understand, you know, if you have 100 workloads and uh, they all have a log4j vulnerability, you have to understand um, only three of those may actually lead to the promised land for an adversary. Wouldn't you like to know that up front? The other 97 are a dead end. Wouldn't that be great to know up front? And that's where the visibility into the hub comes into play. And how does everything communicate when there is no more network through a cloud provider platform? through the identity fabric. The identity fabric is where the permits and denies are. If you wanna use an old school firewall mindset, that's where the levers that are creating all these insane identity chains and lateral movement conduits are controlled is through that IAM fabric, be it you know, policies and identities, service principles, roles, uh, bucket policies, things like that. It's all done through IAM. And um, another maze or another analogy that I like to use is the maze analogy, okay? Most folks think about solving a maze from the outside in, 
It's the same kind of hub and spoke mentality when you're trying to secure your cloud, when you're trying to do it starting at the workloads, right? Sunry looks at your cloud fundamentally different than anyone else in this environment. It's because we look at things from the inside out. And what that means is, wouldn't it be nice to focus on what matters most to the business when starting to secure your cloud? Understand where that data is, but then being able to tell who and what can access it. Super, super powerful story there. It's probably my, my favorite part of Sunry is being able to explain to folks and, you know, I'll, uh, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'll show you. Okay. So if I go back into, you know, the exact same scenario that I showed you where this credit card file uh, is, you know, accessible uh, along with all these other files in that workload, I'm going to flip the story around. Now I can tell you, starting with the data, starting with the inside of the maze, every single identity that can access this credit card file, almost every single one of them is what we call a non-person identities roles and compute. There's that EC2 instance right there. 44 different identities. And this is always an, a really great conversation when we are able to show this to customers because it just it's a level of visibility. The light bulb goes off. They were not aware. Oh my goodness. This is all these different identities can access it. And now, you know, by me showing you my health sandbox automate and exploiting that instance, just how easy it is for just one of those conduits to be exploited. But in that scenario, there's 44 and almost every one of them isn't even the same account. They're in different accounts. All right. So um, it, it, it is very real, but fundamentally a takeaway for the audience today is think about securing things from the inside out. Think about figuring out the maze on day one and reverse engineering it and the ability to do that over and over and over again in a very dynamic, ephemeral world, okay? Another analogy that I like to use is this one, right? So giving you a bunch of vulnerabilities to fix without understanding the data and who and what has access to it that I just showed you is like telling you that 45 doors and windows to an office are entry points into that office building, okay? But not telling you that in that entire 50 story office building, there's only one story that even has a tenant. The south stairwell is the fastest way to get there. There's a door inside that tenant with something special, but 853 things, most of those not people, have access to that door. You didn't know it. And by the way, it changes every day. That's powerful. That's powerful when you have that level of knowledge. You have it today, you have it tomorrow, you have it in the, in the future as you know, your cloud changes and shifts and grows and, um, and, and all that stuff as IAC, it's continued to be pushed out there. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, folks that know me, they give me grief, they have for years and years and years. Uh, I earned the nickname Kill Chain Moncrief at Cisco, uh, and it's because I fundamentally believe in the cyber kill chain and a network uh, environment, network on-prem type scenario for securing it and understanding how adversaries move. The exact same concept exists in the public cloud. The difference is the conduit with which the attack plays out. It happens through the identity model, right? That's where the infiltration that's where the reconnaissance comes into play, enumerating roles. That's where the privileged escalation is with actually jumping from one identity into another, moving laterally through the environment, and then ultimately achieving your objective, okay? But knowing that, how do we fix it, right? So once you figure out these every single possible attack chain, you have to be able to understand then what's needed, what's not needed. And by far, the majority of these different conduits are not needed. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons, years and years of pushing code out there, like I mentioned, turnover, attrition, orphan things, whatever it might be. New folks come in, they have no idea if it's needed or not. They're just trying to make sense of what they kind of walked into. So you need the ability to actually understand which of, which of this is used, okay? Which leads us to a couple of, primary use cases that, um, that I really want folks to wrap their heads around, okay? The first is constantly mapping all of those permissions and understanding every possible path 
understanding privileged escalation scenarios, and then understanding separation of duties violations. But really, the idea is that you want to get to least privilege, okay? And that's removing orphaned identities, removing unused roles, unused keys, okay? And then once you've figured out what needs to be removed, which significantly will reduce the risk landscape, okay? Then you can figure out, okay, what's being used is almost always excessively entitled, okay? And what you want to do is be able to model those entitlements, figure out what's used, what's not used, strip out with a click of a button what's not needed, and remove those excess of entitlements. And if you think about, you know, the attack chain that we kind of looked at um, in Sunry uh, for, you know, the, 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 the chain that I demonstrated, in reality, several of those roles aren't used at all. And the role that I use from jump from one environment to another is used for one particular thing only. It doesn't need all of those other entitlements that were attached to it. Um, so even that in itself could be stripped down to least privilege. But the takeaway is what happens is as you do this, you are hardening the cloud. You're removing the chains. We call them breaking the chains here. That's exactly what you're doing. You're breaking the chains so that when an adversary gets in, because remember, they will, they log in more than likely it's gonna be a dead end. And even if that particular workload does have a permission to go do one particular thing, you're gonna be able to track and alert on it if something anomalous does happen there, okay? Break glass accounts, those kinds of things. We can monitor those. They should never be used except in case of emergency. No problem. You need the ability to monitor whether they've been used and then alert if something is nefarious going on with something that has you know, full admin access into uh, the cloud provider. And then you also need the ability really to understand uh, toxic combinations and privileged escalation risk. And toxic combinations um, are almost impossible. And to be honest with you, most of what I'm talking about and showed you here in summary is almost impossible to understand if you only have access to the cloud provider command line or um, web console. But toxic combinations means that there has been uh, a number of permissions granted to uh, an identity where they can jump into a production uh, in using one particular identity from maybe a sandbox and create an account or create a particular piece of code. Then they can jump in another one of those identities. And remember, it's like just like all those roles that I showed you that I enumerated and then execute that code and then jump in through a third one and then actually uh, give themselves another permission with something like I am pass role. So it's something that you would have never seen with, with the naked eye, but it's how an adversary can maneuver and essentially put little pieces of the puzzle together individually by using different attack conduits um, in the cloud. And then obviously things like privileged escalation where it's, hey, I'm just going to assume something else that has way more permissions than I ever had uh, that were directly entitled to me so that I can do whatever I want, right? So you have to be able to understand that landscape. And then ultimately thinking about it from the inside out where we're talking about least access, understanding upfront, what means the most to the business, whether it's sensitive data, sensitive containers, production level accounts, a critical application, and being able to answer the question, who and what can access it? Um, I had no idea that 46 different identities across six different accounts can access it. And how much of that's used? Well, 90% of that's not even used. And then it, being able to govern it moving forward. So it really is about being able to um, understand that full attack chain, break it where things are not needed, break it where things are overly entitled, and then govern it from the inside out, understanding always every possible way an adversary can move through the iron fabric to get what to get to whatever means um, the most to the business. Okay. And this is just kind of a, a plug on Sunry. Okay. Uh, and you know, we do have some really cool capabilities that customers come to us for that you can't find anywhere else. One is our toxic permissions analyzer. That's the ability to build those chains that I showed you, build them from left to right with the identities to data, or more importantly, again, I believe this, more importantly, from right to left, from the inside out, from data out, because that's meaningful to the business versus just focusing on a bunch of identities when you have no idea what they lead to, okay? And then cloud access is intelligence, right? The ability to have incredible analytics that do incredible things like bubble up what could do the most damage to the business, answer questions about your cloud that you were never 
able to answer before because of the ability to build these identity chains and view your cloud in an identity centric view um, when, you know, you never were really able to do that before. Uh, and then we have some great capabilities built in uh, to actually go fix this uh, for our customers, enforce least privilege, remove un unused identities, sandbox things that might be exposed. It's all built into the platform, um, along with some really great capabilities there with, uh, with anomaly detection, kind of like we've been talking about. So I'm going to stop right there and uh, I'm going to ask Cody. Cody, do we have any questions that have come in? So we have received quite a few questions, and so I'm going to also encourage our audience to continue sending in your questions. We will get to as sure. many as we can in the next 20 minutes. So starting from the top, Sonrai is used on top of the features from the cloud provider. Do you integrate with some of the native tools as well? We do integrate with the native tools. So, you know, if I just pick on AWS, we integrate with AWS Config, AWS Inspector. We integrate with Guard Duty. Um, we uh, Control Tower, uh, Access Analyzer. There's a number of features that just in AWS that we integrate with. We're an AWS Professional Services partner. We're also a partner with the, um, the Identity Business Unit. And it's because we're able to give those uh, abilities that are very complementary to the native tooling and then extend that story. But yes, we do uh, ingest data from all of the major cloud service providers from a telemetry standpoint to help enrich our story to tell a better story for customers. Yes. Awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, do, we need, do we need extra configuration builds for the environment or will AI perform the configuration? Um, what, what can you say to that? Um, I don't know that I understand the question fully, Cody, but I will say that it's from a configuration standpoint. Sunry is very painless to plug into customer environments and it just does its initial discovery with a role and a permission itself, right? We then figure out what all is out there. We figure out all the relationships and then we put our analytics on top of it, which will expose all of these scenarios um, that are unnecessary risk. Uh, and we bubble it up front and then with a few clicks of a button, we actually can help you uh, remove it. And from a, an AI standpoint, that is an interesting term. We actually, you're not going to find another vendor in this space that uses big data clusters out in the public cloud. So we have big AWS EMR clusters that are just doing machine learning constantly, figuring out different scenarios, figuring out all these different risk vectors for customers and feeding it and then developing that, that, that known good model for every single identity, person, non-person, every data container, every token and key, learning what's needed and not needed and then alerting on deviations. Um, so there are some cool capabilities built in, but I will say that on the customer side, there is not much that you have to do here. And I will say that once we plug in and we find the, you know, the lay of the land, we might call it, Cody, um, customers start to learn. They learn through Sunry and through our policies and our recommendations, best practices, why you shouldn't have inline policies, why you should have managed instead, why you shouldn't give star access to things, why a privileged escalation scenario is created because you created this cross-account trust that you never really saw any harm in creating because it allowed this instance to go do something in prod via a Lambda to an S3 bucket. So uh, our customers do get quite a lot of education from the platform itself as well. Awesome. No education is key. So that, that seems like it's, uh, it's meant to help prevent it from continuing to happen after it just happens that one time. Exactly. Awesome. Um, so how about integrations with, pro with popular cross-cloud management? Uh, any well-known platforms that you guys uh, are integrated with? Yeah, I'd say, so if I look at just our customer base, you know, yes, customers use the, the actual user interface itself for investigations, but we, our customers are very, very large organizations. And um, a lot of them financials, a lot of them uh, consumer products and telco organizations, and they all integrate with their SIM, SOAR, or ticketing, uh, you know, ser service of choice for their business. So we, out of the box, can route risk to ServiceNow, Jira, Slack channels, uh, maybe it's Sentinel, something like that. Uh, Security Hub, and there's all kinds of different ways that Sunry can route that risk that we find to customers. The neat thing about that is that it's very, very 
uh, extend, extensible in the product, meaning, you know, we divide your cloud into these projects and that's how we figure out which analytics matter for that project, what the business cares about. We have a nice R back so that they can log in and only see what's assigned to them and scope to them. But ultimately maybe that particular team or that project, they want to be, you know, they want Jira or they want service now, right? So we'll route the risk through that conduit natively through Sunry, but another team wants to be notified through email and another team wants to be notified through Slack. You can have all those different configurations and, and integrations in one tenant with Sunry to interact with the different business units, however they want to interact. And of course, they see something that's interesting, something they, they want to, you know, take a deeper dive into. They can come right back from the ticket itself that was sent out, or they can interact like a lot of our larger customers do straight from the API, um, grab a lease privilege policy, grab that JSON right there, uh, or maybe grab additional telemetry or metadata about an incident that we have uh uncovered that might be a, you know, a lateral movement or a privileged escalation scenario. So there's a number of ways that you can interact back with the, pro the product as well. Awesome. So um, that might tie nicely into this next question that asks, uh, it looks like, it looks like a good source for SIEM systems. Can we integrate its API with an external SIEM? A thousand percent. Yes. That's exactly what I just described. Uh, and uh, that's how the majority of our customers integrate with us is via one of our direct integrations. And I'll actually show you here, um, I think it's under configure integrations. This is just a few of the ones that are built into our demo system here. We do have a fully functioning um, GraphQL based API. It is very, very slick. Um, if I actually go to search advanced, you can actually see here that we have a, a built in um, GraphQL query editor where our customers can interact directly with us over the API, craft their queries. It's all documented. They can practice them in here before they put them in their Python scripts or whatever that might be. But um, yeah, we have a very, very extensive API where you can interact with us with a SIM or a SOAR. Uh, everything that you see in the UI here is um, fully built off of API endpoints and um so uh, everything that you see here is fully accessible and you can interact with over our API. It's a great question. What else you got? So you mentioned AWS CloudTrail. Do you analyze against guard duty events as well? We do. We do. It's interesting. Um, if I just pull up Cloud Insights here, the homepage, we don't have any active threats in this particular scenario, but this is where we would be feeding guard duty into the product uh, through a couple of different, and actually it actually says right here, leverages summary threat insights into issues like AWS guard duty, workload protection findings, and additional noteworthy CBEs. Uh, we do have an agentless scanner as well. Um, so, you know, if you want to use our agentless scanner to look for vulnerabilities on your workload, you can do that. Um, it's a cool feature, but it, for us, that's just additional attribution into the identity risk that we're exposing. Uh, but we absolutely do ingest guard duty and we use that to enhance our telemetry. Yep. So how should one uh, handle the need for organizations to stay updated on latest cloud security threats and solutions to mitigate risks effectively? What, what do they need to do? Yeah, so that's a broad question. <laughs> um, there needs to be intent. There, you have to be intentional, right? So subscribe to dark reading, subscribe to these different publications. Check, plug into LinkedIn feeds and go to CSA events. You know, I presented at CSA events. I'm a member of, a, you know, a, a CSA chapter myself, but go out and network and start to listen to podcasts and, 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 you know, educate yourself on exactly what's going on out there, but there has to be intent. You can't just, you know, sit back and think that you're going to learn about this, this kind of world of, cloud native risk, you're going to have to go do some research, subscribe to some things. Um, I will say that um, I thought that I understood public cloud security before I came to Sunry when I was at Cisco. And I was doing infrastructure as a service security, really focusing on VPC flow logs and NSG flow logs um, and AWS and GCP and then Azure respectively. And I thought I understood it, right? And uh, I, had, I understood what CSPM was. I come over here and I'm quickly humbled to understand that I am, I had a lot to learn about how an attack really plays out in a cloud native world where there are no workloads, where everything is just microservices 
uh, and serverless applications and Kubernetes pods and Docker containers, but they're living, breathing web applications and they do all these different things and communicate, but it's over the identity fabric, right? So I had to go really focus on educating myself in this world of risk. So, um, you know, in summary, intent, network, and get out there. You know what? I got one other, because this is, these are not scripted questions. Cody, the other thing is go do it yourself. Go do what I just did because that has taught me so much. Okay. Go pop open a free EC2 instance. They have the free tier out there at AWS. All right. Learn how to access it from your workstation just by using the AWS command line interface, access uh, the environment, the actual uh, environment itself using a token for an identity that you create, start playing around and just do this. It's amazing how much you will learn when you put yourself in the shoes of an adversary. Yeah, no, that, that makes a whole lot of sense, Jeff. You got to understand where they're coming from before you can stop them from where they're coming. That's right. Awesome. Um, does this tool support GCP and Azure as well? It does. It does. So if I just go back up here, you can see we've got AWS. Um, you can just filter on Azure, you know, access key risk, lateral movement, overprivileged things, um, you know, service principles, those kinds of things. Or we can just focus on what we're seeing in GCP uh, as well as Oracle. Or we can just clear it all and um, see your entire cloud landscape. That's the other neat thing is this is all viewable. Your risk score, all that is you can do it across the entire cloud landscape. You can do it cloud specific. You can do it project and team specific. Uh, you know, all these little widgets are able to be interacted with. And, um, you know, from here, you know, you can see all your untagged data in buckets, just in AWS, you could flip back to um, Azure and just take a look at the data encryption findings that you have there. So we support all these different clouds. It's very, very easy to interact and kind of drill into each one of them here from this homepage. Awesome. Just to piggyback on that one, um, for the cloud service providers, do you support the net of for which cloud service providers do you support the net effective permission calculation? So the net effective permission calculation. I don't know who sent that question. My guess is that someone I know who's messing with me, but, um, <laughs> but that gets us into a question that a, a conversation that we have very often here amongst the ranks at Sunry. And that is the difference between excessive permissions, which the industry likes to use and effective permissions, which is a coin, a, a term that we coined years ago, but the industry is also kind of piggybacked on. The point is that a lot of vendors in this space and even cloud native tools will show you uh, that uh, an identity, person or non-person, has permissions. A lot of those are unused. Some of those permissions might lead to a data container. Some of those permissions might lead to the ability to create a Lambda and execute it. What they cannot show you and this is where Sunry's patented technology comes into play, is how one identity can lead into another, which can lead into another, which can lead into another. You go from one environment to another, you privilege escalate, and then ultimately you have a set of permissions and prod that you were never intended to have, very similar to that live hack scenario that we just did here. So call it what you want, but Sunry is able to show you an end-to-end -end landscape and link it to data that other vendors in the space absolutely cannot do. You go ask them for this data container, can you show me everything that can access it from a sandbox that's 10 hops on an identity chain away? They cannot do it. And that's what sets us apart with our effective permissions. So what features do we have for workload protection with Sunry? Uh, for workload protection, I'll just um, show you kind of the dashboard here. We have the ability to scan agent. There's only a few vendors in the world that can do this really in this space, but agently, agentlessly, agentlessly, sorry, tongue twister there, scan workloads, whether it's containers or VMs in all three cloud service providers and look for vulnerabilities very, very quickly across the entire cloud estate when you don't have agents on those workloads. So it gives our customers an ability to understand vulnerabilities that they would have had no awareness of otherwise, okay? And so on this dashboard here, we can sort by the workloads that are reporting vulnerabilities. We can sort on the, on the vulnerabilities 
themselves. You can dive into the CVEs if you want um, and consume it in a variety of different manners. Like these four different workloads are affected by this CVE. If you wanted to dig into it, you could. But the important thing is that it's not just a vulnerability scanner, but we can then take that vulnerability telemetry and do attribution into the identity risk, which allows our customers to see that end-to-end -end blast scenario, blast radius scenario that they would have never ever uh, seen before. And hey, it's not just a vulnerability, it's a vulnerability with a privileged identity attached to that workload. And that privileged identity can, do, can go do some nefarious things or maybe it's not so privileged, but it is attached via the assume role capability to something else that's privileged that can go do nefarious things or grab data that it should have never touched. And it allows our customers to understand front and center which workloads pose the most risk to the business at any point in time. So it's an incredible capability for, um, for vulnerability detection, but it's really about what we do with that data with attribution into the identity fabric. So hopefully that helps. So it looks like we've got a couple questions left and we've got just a couple minutes left. So we're going to kind of speed around here. Okay. Um, what features do we have for workload protection with Sunray? Uh, that's exactly the one that we just answered. Perfect. Yep. Um, according to your experience, what cloud security certification do you recommend a, a cloud security expert should get updated? Yeah. So I would definitely, first of all, I wouldn't say just jump straight into, I'm going to go get a security certification. A lot of the folks that I talk to, they kind of come from a similar background as me, 20 plus years on prem. This is a whole new world, right? Um, in InfoSec. And I would highly, highly encourage you to go get one of the basic architect certifications in Azure or AWS so that you can actually understand what you're thinking about and, and having to go secure. So you know, that has helped me tremendously being an AWS certified solutions architect, for example. Then think about getting not only your CISSP, but your CCSP, okay? And maybe an AWS as, or an Azure um, specialization in security. So there's a couple of different ways that I would go about doing that. But whichever kind of specialization you want to go into, into security, I would say get something foundational first, not just to prove Right to someone, hey, I'm an AWS certified architect, but to understand what you know S3 regular is, S3 infrequent access is, S3 glacier, I can say that right there because of my studying years ago for the architect exam. So please get like a fundamental, I understand what the cloud does, how the plumbing works first, then go focus on a security specialized certification. All right, and our last and final question uh, they, this participant wants you to recap the attack vector you use to get the shell. Yeah. So the attack vector that I use to get the shell, I will go back to this slide right here. Right. So I was simply demonstrating how this particular public exposure from three weeks ago that was real and really bad to, uh, to GitHub could be exploited. So what I did was I went into GitHub into my fake little repo, I found an accidentally exposed private key. I grabbed it. I combined it with my knowledge of understanding from this next file that there's an IP address out there. And what I did was I popped open my, my MacBook's uh, terminal and I just used the SSH command, SSH minus I. I grabbed the .pim file and then the IP address that I grabbed from that miscellaneous info file that point in time i'm in again who am i aws sts get caller identity on tableau tester that's as easy that's as easy as it is which is why this is so scary and that folks need to be paying attention all right, and with that grim message, we do need to start <laughs> closing things down. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today on Tech Strong Learning. Um, I do want to give you the opportunity to leave us with any parting thoughts or any final words before I take us with some closing housekeeping, give away some gift cards and take us off the air. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, I just, I want to thank everyone for joining. If I could leave you with any takeaways, it's be thinking of your cloud from the inside out, be thinking about that maze analogy, the building analogy, and be thinking about, you know, for years we've been talking about identity is the new perimeter. You need to be thinking about identity is the new network. It is everything. It allows everything to live, breathe, and function and communicate in a cloud native world. And also remember that nine times out of 10, when this happens in real life, hackers don't hack, they just log in. And that's what's so scary. So hopefully that helps everyone. And again, I appreciate your time today. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I would like to remind everyone that our session today was recorded. So should you want to rewatch this, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the on-demand and of course, you can, can find it living on the Security Boulevard website at securityboulevard.com slash webinars. And be sure to look in the on-demand section. It'll be there waiting for you. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Saad H, Brendan W, Jesus B, and Mickey S. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim your gift card. It should make its way over to you in about 48 hours. But if you don't happen to see that email, check your spam folder just in case it got filtered out. I'd like to thank Sonri Security for sponsoring our program today. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you being with us for the past hour. And we want to ask for just one more moment of your time. As soon as we close out, there will be a survey that pops up. So let us know what you thought about our, our program today. Or if you have any suggestions for an upcoming program, do let us know there. Either way, we do hope to see everyone at a future TechStrong learning experience. Have a great rest of your day. And Jeff, thank you again. My pleasure. Take care, everybody.